Have we finally reached a moment where a real cure for HIV could become possible in the next few years? Stay with us until the end, because in today's episode of HIV RNA Test Guide Podcast, we will explain the most promising next-generation HIV cure approaches for 2026, what they mean for people living with HIV, and how you can access these therapies once they become available on the market. Now, let's dive into today's podcast. Hello and welcome to HIV RNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Today, we're looking into uh, the latest sources on next generation HIV cure strategies, mm. really focusing on the 2026 landscape. Right. It's a really fast moving feel. Absolutely. And our goal here is to, you know, cut through some of the complexity and give you a solid grasp of the biggest ideas researchers are pursuing. And maybe the first bit of complexity to tackle is the word cure itself. It means different things in this context. That's crucial, isn't it, for understanding the actual goals of these clinical trials? Yeah. So what are the main distinctions? Well, primarily two. First, there's the sterilizing cure. That's the, let's say, the ultimate goal, completely eliminating every trace of HIV from the body. Every single bit. Okay, total eradication. Exactly. But uh, most of the current work, especially these next-gen therapies, they're really focused on what we call a functional cure. Think of it as long-term remission. Remission. So the virus isn't gone, but it's controlled. Precisely. It's suppressed to such low levels, um, undetectable levels, that the person doesn't need daily medication anymore. They stay healthy, and they can't transmit the virus. The body keeps it in check on its own. And that's the real game-changer, potentially. Because current treatments, RT, they're fantastic, but it's a lifelong commitment. It is. Daily pills, potential side effects over the long term, the cost, the, you know, the burden of it. So a functional cure takes HIV from being this chronic condition needing constant management to something well, functionally resolved. That's the hope. It would fundamentally change everything from individual lives to global public health strategy. Okay, let's unpack this then. If those are the targets, eradication or remission, what are the, say, top five strategies researchers are really pushing forward right now? Maybe start with the most uh, direct approach. Right. Let's start with gene editing. This is probably the most direct shot at that sterilizing cure we talked about. It uses tools like CRISPR. CRISPR? Okay. Yeah. Like scissors for DNA. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Very precise molecular scissors. The idea is to go into the infected cells and literally cut out the HIV DNA, the proviral DNA that's hidden inside the person's own genome. So you're uninstalling the virus's code directly from the human cell. Exactly. Or another approach is to edit the human genes, like the CCR5 receptor gene, to make the cells resistant to HIV infection in the first place, kind of like locking the door so the virus can't get in. But doesn't HIV hide out in these uh, latent reservoirs? Resting cells. How do you make sure you get all of them, even if you miss a tiny fraction? That's the massive challenge. You've hit on it. It's a precision problem and a delivery problem. How do you get the editing tool into every single one of those long-lived resting T cells where the virus hides? Are there candidates actually trying this now? Oh, yes. EBT-101 is one example using CRISPR. It's designed specifically to cut out integrated HIV DNA. They've finished dosing in trials and are now in the long-term safety follow-up phase. So potential for a true cure. But the hurdles are significant hitting the right target, avoiding off-target edits, and just reaching all the hidden virus. Extremely significant hurdles, yes. Requires incredible efficiency and, above all, safety. Okay, so if editing the inside of the cell is one way, what about tackling it from the outside, maybe boosting the body's own defenses? That brings us to engineered immune cells, right? Yes, the second big idea. Engineered immune cells, specifically CAR-RT cells. This technology comes straight from cancer treatment. CAR T chimeric antigen receptor T cells. How does that work for HIV? It's a similar process. You take a person's own immune cells, T cells, out of their body. In the lab, you genetically engineer them to produce a special receptor, the HRR, on their surface. And this receptor is designed to spot HIV. Exactly. It specifically recognizes proteins on the surface of HIV-infected cells. Then you grow billions of these engineered cells and infuse them back into the patient. Creating a sort of living drug, immune cells programmed to hunt and kill. That's a great way to put it. They become this long-term surveillance system within the body, potentially keeping the virus suppressed without needing daily drugs. 
What's new in this space for 2026? Are there refinements? Definitely. Researchers are getting more sophisticated. They're designing CAR T cells that don't just kill infected cells, but might also, say, see helpful immune signals or even broadly neutralizing antibodies to boost the overall attack. And I saw something about combining this with shock and kill. Right. That's a key strategy. You use drugs called latency reversing agents or LRAs to shock the hidden virus out of its resting state, making the infected cells visible. And then the CAR T cells come in for the kill. Precisely. The LRA lights up the target and the RP cells destroy it. But this sounds incredibly personalized and probably very expensive. Is there work on making it more scalable, like an off the shelf version? Yes, that's a huge focus. The current autologous method using the patient's own cells is complex and costly. The push is towards allogeneic CRRT nails, using cells from healthy donors that could potentially be manufactured at scale and used for many patients. Makes sense. But still, complex technology, potential for side effects like the immune system overreacting. Absolutely. Safety and managing potential side effects like cytokine release syndrome are paramount in the ongoing trials. Okay, so we have gene editing and we have engineered immune cells. What's the third approach? Something maybe less intensive. That would be broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs. Yeah. These are different from the antibodies your body might normally make. How so? They're special antibodies often discovered in people whose bodies naturally control HIV very well or they're engineered in the lab. Their key feature is that they can neutralize a wide variety of different HIV strains. Because HIV mutates so readily, right? You need something that hints many versions. Exactly. They often target parts of the virus that don't change much across strains, the conserved regions, making it harder for the virus to escape. They're typically given by infusion. But antibodies don't last forever. How do they fit into a cure strategy if they need repeat doses? Good point. They're often seen as part of a combination strategy or maybe as a way to maintain remission after RT is stopped. Rarely are they tested completely alone for a cure. So... Combined with other things. Yes. You'll see trials combining several different BNAVs together, a cocktail approach to prevent escape, or pairing them with therapeutic vaccines, or maybe even those LRAs we mentioned. The cocktail idea makes sense, hitting the virus from multiple angles. But still, infusions. Right, which is why a major research push is to engineer BNABs with much longer half-lives. Instead of needing an infusion every few weeks, maybe it's every few months or even longer, that makes them much more practical. Okay, that leads nicely into the fourth strategy, therapeutic vaccines. We know preventative vaccines aim to stop infection, but what do therapeutic ones do for someone already living with HIV? Their goal is different. They aim to train or boost the person's existing immune system to fight HIV more effectively. It's like giving the immune system a refresher course on how to recognize and attack the virus, hopefully allowing the body to control it without art. An immune system tune-up. Have we seen any progress there recently? Yes, there's been some encouraging news. For example, a combination vaccine approach called AELI-003 showed promising signals in a phase two trial. It uses something called an HTI immunogen. HTI. HIV-1 T-cell immunogen. It's designed to train T-cells a key part of the immune system, to recognize parts of the virus that are highly conserved, meaning they don't mutate much. The idea is to create a really durable, broad immune response. But again, we come back to the reservoir problem, don't we? Yeah. Can boosting the immune system alone really clear out those hidden cells? Often, no. That seems to be the limitation. The virus hides too well in those latent cells. So therapeutic vaccines are increasingly viewed as one important piece of a larger puzzle. Like maybe they help clean up after something else flushes the virus out. Mm. Exactly. They could be crucial in combination strategies, perhaps used after an LRA shocks the virus out, the vaccine helps the immune system kill it more effectively, or maybe alongside BNAVs for broader control. Okay, this brings us to a really interesting point, the fifth one, which isn't a cure strategy itself, but deeply affects the context, long-acting prevention. Yes, this is hugely important background. The advances in prevention have been remarkable. We now have things like long-acting injectable pre-P. Like Lena Capivir used to go once every six months. That's the one, a capsid inhibitor given just twice a year for pre-P. That level of effective, easy-to-use prevention is a massive public health win. But how does having such great prevention tools impact the search for a cure? doesn't make it harder. In some ways, yes. It raises the bar ethically and practically for cure research. When the existing standard of care, both treatment with art and prevention with things like lenacapavir, is so good and relatively safe. Then the potential risks of an experimental cure therapy. 
like gene editing or CAR-RT, have to be weighed much more carefully against a much smaller potential benefit compared to, say, 20 years ago. Precisely. Researchers have to demonstrate a very compelling reason, a significant potential advantage, to justify asking someone stable on art or well protected by pre-P to participate in a complex, potentially risky cure trial. So better prevention actually makes cure trials more complex to design and run. It forces the field to be even more rigorous, more focused on safety, and maybe slows down the process a bit because the ethical considerations are heightened. It's a good problem to have in a way, but it does shape the research landscape. Okay, so pulling these five threads together, the gene editing, the CRT cells, the BNABs, therapeutic vaccines, all against this backdrop of powerful prevention. Yeah. What's the big takeaway theme for 2026? I think the overwhelming theme is combination. The idea of a single magic bullet, one therapy that works for everyone, that's largely faded. Right. Almost all the promising research now involves using two or more strategies together. Maybe an LRA to wake the virus, followed by CHI-RT cells or a therapeutic vaccine to clear it. Maybe with BNABs for long-term patrol. So it's like weeding a garden. You need tools to dig out the deep roots. That's like the gene editing or LRAs. Then maybe something to prevent new seeds from sprouting the vaccine and maybe ongoing surveillance the BNABs or CAR-T. That's a really good analogy. You need that multi-pronged attack because HIV is so complex in how it persists and hides in the body. Which leads to the big question everyone listening probably has. Are we going to see a cure, a widely available cure, in 2026? Uh, almost certainly not a widely available sterilizing cure by then, no. I think 2026 is realistically shaping up to be more of a crucial foundation-building year. What does that mean in practice? It means we'll see key results from these mid-stage trials, testing combinations. We'll get much clearer data on safety, on which delivery methods for gene editing are working, which chi -RT designs are most effective, which combinations actually show synergy. So building the evidence base, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Exactly. Solidifying the proof of concept for these combined approaches. But translating that into something widely available takes much, much longer. And even if the science gets there, the source has highlighted some major non-scientific roadblocks. Oh, absolutely. Safety is number one. These are powerful interventions, especially gene editing and CAR-T. Trials have to proceed very cautiously with intense monitoring. That takes time. Then there's ethics, ensuring informed consent, fair access to trials. Right. And then the huge one, access and cost. Even if we develop a successful functional cure tomorrow, these initial therapies are likely to be incredibly expensive. Making them affordable and accessible globally, that's a monumental challenge. So connecting this all back to you, our listener, what's the takeaway message for now? I think first it's important perspective. Current RT is highly effective. Stay connected with your healthcare provider. Stick to your treatment if you're on it. And prevention options are getting better and easier, like the long-acting injectables. Definitely explore those options if pre-EP is right for you. And know that clinical trials for cures are happening, but they involve significant commitment and potential risks. They must be done under strict medical supervision. Don't try any of this at home, basically. Absolutely not. And maybe a final thought to leave people with, connecting the science to the bigger picture. I think what the sources suggest, and what seems likely, is that we might actually reach the scientific milestone proof that a functional cure is possible sooner than we can solve the global health challenge of delivering it. Meaning the science could outpace our ability to make it equitable and affordable worldwide. Yes. Bridging that gap between a scientific breakthrough and actual global impact, that's probably the defining challenge for the decade after the breakthrough happens. The science is moving fast, but the logistics and ethics of global access are incredibly complex. A really important point. It's not just about the lab work. If you want to keep following this, look to trusted sources, major universities, public health organizations, reputable clinics. Stay informed, but be patient. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Indeed. That was The Deep Dive. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.